Hello everyone and welcome to a Custer Weekly Recap. We are here to talk about not really Overwatch League stuff. Nothing has really happened since the last time I talked to you. We're kind of in the dead part of the offseason. But there has been a lot of updates with Overwatch World Cup as well as a bunch of Overwatch 2 developer blogs relevant to Overwatch 2 as a game as a whole. So I thought we'd just talk about that. This should be a short video. If this is over 10 minutes and you look at it right now, then I've messed up. I want this to be under 10 minutes. So let's let's get through it really quick. So Overwatch World Cup is coming. You know, we have the open trials from February 10th to 26th where players can sign up for these teams and try and make their way into these World Cup teams. Uh, we have all the groups situated and sorted. There was a lot of drama around the teams that got chosen. It is based on player population data. So that is how these teams were selected and put into these groups. Of these groups, uh, they will be divided up uh, uh, after the official qualifiers. But first of all, we have the wild card because the wild card has been a hot topic because some of these teams were forgotten on the original list that have very strong teams. Denmark and Finland specifically have been very outspoken about how they should have been included. But I'm glad that Blizzard is putting a wild card in there. They should be able to make it out of these groups. After these wild cards and make it out, two of the three teams will make it out of each group of EMEC A and EMEC B. And they will make it into the original EMEC groups. Uh, I should have them right here. So they're going to end up in EMEC. I don't even know how they've decided to format it on the website. But they'll end up in the EMEC groups. I believe that is these ones. Um... And they will be able to qualify out of these. So these ones will go from six teams to eight teams, which is probably worse for all these teams because they did not expand how many qualify out. But at least we will get the best teams and the best opportunity for all of these teams to come to BlizzCon and really enjoy that. Psycho is very upset as a player because he's very, you know, he's from Austria and they also didn't even make the wild card. So first of all, we had Denmark and Finland with their pitchforks out being upset that they didn't make the original groupings, but they made the wild cards. But Austria did not make the wild cards and Psycho believes they should have. Personally, I think you have to draw a line somewhere. It sucks that Austria is on the way out and potentially they could have qualified through the wild cards and made BlizzCon, but you know, maybe they could have expanded it, but I don't even know if Austria would have been next on the list of teams because it is based on player population data and not the highest quality of teams that Blizzard could think of and put together, right? Maybe in the future when we get the World Cup rolling again over multiple years, fingers crossed, then they'll be able to recognize which teams should be in, which ones should be not in, and we can get a more competitive environment in the future. But this is the first time we've done it in a long while. We don't even know which the best countries are. We can speculate, but there's a lot of countries that are very good and some that are really quite poor, but just popular Overwatch countries. So that's the World Cup. Uh, we'll see some stuff starting to pop up sooner or later. Once they choose the coaches, the social medias, and the GMs, we start to see these teams formed and the trials begin. Hopefully there'll be a lot of content coming out of that. So let's talk about the Overwatch news and the developer blogs. Overwatch developers have been popping off, just releasing a ton of content, just talking about you know the matchmaker, the balance, uh, we also just recently had a Defense Matrix Initiative one. So I'm going to give you a quick deal TLDR because there's a lot of reading. And, you know, most of us on the internet don't like to read. So I'll, I'll sum it all up for you what's happened over the last few days with all of these developer blogs. If you want to find any of them yourself, go to this website, overwatchblizzard.com. New section, you'll be able to find them and read them more thoroughly. So first one was from Aaron Keller that came out on January 27th. It's not a lot in here, just a lot of just like, hey, we're going to communicate more. Here's what you should expect coming in season three. Lots of fun stuff. Uh, he sort of talked about there is going to be a bunch of ch uh, number changes in season three. Their alt refund when swapping heroes is going to go down from 30% uh, to 25%. So it's interesting change across the board. There's going to be bug fixes, a bunch of changes, but that's pretty much all that he really said. So then we had the uh, matchmaker goals and plans. This was part two. They had a part one that came out at some point in the past. And they were essentially talking more about MMR and your shown rank and their changes moving forward with season three. They nicely put a TLDR because they know, once again, we don't like to read on the internet. 
So the TLDR is your ranked games are formed based on your initial making, uh, your in internal matchmaking rating. So we've talked about that before. Your hidden MMR is what your account is actually rated as. The visual rank that you have of like Diamond 5, Master 3, etc, etc, etc. That visual rank is actually not as important as your internal MMR. And that's what really determines the matchmaking of the game. So you might have a higher internal MMR than what your rank is showing. And that's why, you know, you'd be like, why am I playing with a gold player when I'm a diamond player? Maybe that gold player is actually a plat player and a high plat player. They just haven't ranked their account up from the seasonal decay. So regardless if you just play kills, uh, skill tier. MMR changes based on the result of each match with the amount of MMR you gain or lose depending on several factors like how highly rated your opponents were or how recently you last played. So after every single game, your hidden MMR will change. So don't worry about that and your five and seven win losses as much. Uh, but actually talking about that, for competitive play in season three, they're going to reduce the number of wins between competitive updates from seven to five wins and the number of losses from 20 to 15. So instead of having to play seven matches and then get your rank or win seven matches and get your rank or lose 20, hopefully not, then you will, your rank will update. It'll only be five. Uh, these changes will come in with season three. Uh, what else was in here as well? Season four, so not this upcoming season, the season after that, they'll be including additional information about your current wins and losses on the competitive screens. They've begun working on a feature in which you'll be able to look at your wins and losses before you actually like start getting promoted. So you'll have more information of why you're getting promoted and relegated in specific ways. A nice little tidbit in this one as well was there is top 500 changes. Top 500 players will see their top 500 leaderboard rank updated after every match rather than in competitive updates, which is nice because if you've been watching streamers and stuff like that, top 500 is just kind of a, a bit of a shit show right now, re realistically, because the way that the competitive updates are made, your top 500, you finish your competitive update and then it just says you're still top 500 and your number moves almost arbitrarily. You can't really see any rhyme or reason of why it's going up and down. So that should be changed for season three, hopefully. That was a pretty much most of the matchmaker changes. You can read it for yourself. They had a Q and A at the bottom of like, oh, what are, what are people asking? And we can answer that for you. The TLDR of the questions are people were like, why aren't I a higher rank? And the developers were like, get good scrubs. It's kind of what happened. Um, that, and a big thing as well that is going to be coming out of this uh, developer blog and coming in season four, they're planning on removing seasonal competitive rank resets and all current and past seasonal rank decay. So there will not be a visual MMR decay after every season. So right now, you know how you go into a new season and you go from, oh, I finished gold three, but it drops me down to silver four every season. They're removing that from the game starting season four. So... I know a lot of people are going to rejoice about that. I personally liked the decay because it meant I was climbing up to something, even if it had nothing to do with my internal MMR. I just like seeing numbers go up, but I understand everybody is different. Wait, no, numbers go down. I'm not decreasing in rank. I'm going up in rank, of course. Okay, and then talking about Season 2 retrospective. They talked about Ramatra and a lot of the issues that have happened with Ramatra. They said off the rip, he was quite weak when they had that two-week grace period in quick play. Everyone was like, his ultimate wasn't doing much because everyone just ran away. So that's when they gave the buff to Ramatra to have movement speed and be able to run people down. They gave him some more armor. And Ramatra became incredibly strong, especially with some of the nerfs to Orisa. So Ramatra has become dominant in the meta. We've all seen the clips of the two Ramatras just sort of standing there with their ultimates up, like blocking as Akiriko heals them. It's, it's, it's awful. It's awful. But they've recognized that that is an issue. They're going to be in Season 3 changing Annihilation so that it is no longer permanent with his ultimate if you're standing near enemies and it will have a maximum cap of 20 seconds that the counter will in, uh, increase in duration if you're... How do I describe this? Annihilation will tick down slower if enemies are in it instead of pausing the timer entirely. That's the best way I can describe it for you guys. Should hopefully stop a lot of these standoffs of Ramatras just standing there, unkillable. They also talked about the battle for Olympus. 
And the event that happened, they said there was a lot of issues with it. You know, environmentals weren't being chosen. Obviously, it wasn't super fun for certain things. They had a, a little bit of a reflection on that, but they said that they will be doing this event again, but iterating on it in a better way. Um, that's pretty much all that was in here. Oh, they're, they're reintroducing uh, credits. So I uh, remember when you open loot boxes and you got credits and you're like, yay, I can spend them on the skins that I didn't have. They're introducing those and also making all Overwatch 1 skins available for purchase with those credits. So in the battle pass, you'll be able to get credits. You'll be able to get things that will be able to buy skins and old skins. And they've said that they're going to make those skins just more available to newer players compared to, you know, the newer skins that are coming out with Overwatch 2, which are still going to be worth premium currency. But I think this is the right change. There's no reason they should be charging $19 for an old skin that everyone got for free out of a loot box six years ago. So that's a good change for Overwatch. You know, as much as we can say that they shouldn't have done that in a while, uh, they shouldn't have done that initially. It's how it is now. And the last one, this was more of a defense matrix, which is the sort of cheating and uh, banning system that they sort of have implemented for Overwatch 2. I'm not going to talk too much about this. The TLDR is make sure to report people if you have disruptive behavior in your games. They've been banning cheaters. They've been banning abusive people. They've been silencing abusive people. They've been doing a, a lot of work to really help people and protect people in games. It's never going to be perfect because it's the internet. The internet is also doesn't know how to read, but is also very mean sometimes. So they're trying to help people out with that. They're also introducing a streamer protection system that is going to allow you to hide the player names in your lobbies. They're going to hide your personal name. They're also going to be able to hide your queue time or delay your queue time if uh, you are a streamer so that you can avoid getting stream sniped and dealing with just people who want to be toxic in your games to a content creator. And that's it. Hopefully I did it in under 10 minutes. I don't have a clock running, but that is all the updates that has been humming from Blizzard for Overwatch 2. It's cool that we're getting a lot of communication. We're getting a lot of knowledge coming out and just sort of their direction that they're leading Overwatch 2. In the past, it's just sort of been, oh yeah, we'll communicate more with you guys and then radio silence. So hopefully this should be them turning over a new leaf with Overwatch 2 and we'll start to see some of these features be implemented. There's been a lot of talk so far with not as much execution. So I'm hoping they can start executing and creating some really fun stuff leading into the PvE release of Overwatch 2 and everything that is to come. So I hope that was informative. I hope that helped you not have to read and just listen to my dumbass try and read. But I appreciate you all. Uh, hopefully there'll be some Overwatch League news, a community update coming out next week and I'll be able to recap some of that stuff for you as well. So thank you very much for watching. Love you all. Make sure to like and subscribe to this video and I will see you guys next time.